Good evening, Edgemont community. My name is Teresa Kaufman. I am the VP of Parent Forum Forums on the PTSA. We welcome you tonight to a virtual talk with Christina Chow. Chu. Chu, excuse me, Chu, who's going to speak to us tonight about um, growing up Chinese American and how it has informed the person that she is now. Um, Apologies for the glasses, but I'm going to read her bio just so we're all up to speed about Christina. Christina is a speaker and author of two award-winning books, Beauty and Troublemaker and Other Saints. As a speaker, Ms. Chu shares her experience growing up Chinese American and how it informed the person she is now. Throughout her life, she has used writing as a vehicle for self-empowerment and advocacy, providing the foundation for the development of critical thinking skills in navigating our social sphere. She also shares her strategies for advocacy and empowerment technique for staying grounded in the face of growing and systematic racism. Ms. Chu has presented at Organization Association for Asian American Studies, organizations including the Asian American Writers Workshop, Hedgebrook, which is a global community of women writers, and Prison Rights, which supports incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals to tell their stories. Ms. Chu is a founding member of the Asian American Writers Workshop. She curates and hosts the Penn Parentis Library, Literary excuse me, Salon and New York Writers Workshops, Let's Talk Books. She has moderated panels at the Association of Writers and Writing Programs and the Shuffle Collective. An Edgemont alum, Ms. Chu received a BA from Bates and an MFA from Columbia University. Welcome, Christina. Thank you. Um, so I guess one, a few of the things that I'll start with. Uh, like you know, I went to Edgemont myself. I grew up there. I went to Sealy Place School and uh, went on to Edgemont. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I want, I want you to understand as a parent is that I too am a parent. I have a, a son who's a senior uh, right now. We live in the city and I also have a, a fourth grader. I don't know if any of you, I, you know, we've had so many shootings <laughs> in the past uh, few months and years, but my son was particularly upset uh, after the Atlanta shootings. And he, he, he was upset in part because of the way the media was reacting to it, but also just how crazy everything has been and how difficult it has been not, you know, being a person who's Asian and watching everything kind of spiral out of control. I don't think Asian Americans are the only ones who understand how this feels. I think in some respects, we all can understand this, right? Uh, but when my son uh, explained to me that he could not go to school the next morning, I realized the trauma that he was going through and that all students were going through. Uh, I had thought, you know, most adults would feel uncomfortable, but it, it really hit home that the students and young people were really getting hit hard. Now, I know there's a high population of um, Asians um, at Edgemont, maybe 40% uh, or close to that. And, um, but I think what's important to remember is that whether or not you're Asian or not, when something traumatic happens, everyone, gets affected by it. It's not just the person who gets attacked, right? And I think in the past, we had a more laissez-faire attitude about this. If someone, you know, called you chink or did something to you, um, there was this feeling that we were a progressive society and we're moving forward and you know, so and so's being, you know, stupid or ridiculous, but but that and but you know that we would change and with education, right? Because it's a, there's a notion that um, racism comes with ignorance, but we see now that that might be partly true, but um, but that 
it's pretty much a part of our lives. We can't expect that things will 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 get better. We we just have to accept that it's kind of here, and we we need to face these issues. And the question really is how, right? You know, uh, so I spoke with um, Kyle about coming to speak with the students because, you know, we schools, schools, of course, academic, we, you know, I know, cause I went to Edgemont, it was very um, rigorous, but, um, and, but there's a social component and there's the um, ethical, the ethics that we learn and the morals that we learn and the values that we teach right starting from kindergarten right you know share um be you know we're equal kindness right and the thing is is we need to acknowledge that wait hold on one second we as an adults we we as parents we need to follow through with that lesson we don't just say something and then the kids walk away they're like yeah right right um because then we're just hypocrites. <laughs> you know, it's, I think we all can remember when parents did that to us and we thought like, what a hypocrite, right? And that can make such a difference. Um, and, and also what's also important is to acknowledge your, your student, uh, your, your child when something happens, um, talk, definitely talk to them. It can be really strange, like, what do you say, right? Um, you know, when when hateful things happen. I'll start by, by sharing my story as a parent, uh, I mean, as a student at Edgemont. You know, uh, we my family was the first Chinese American family on the block. Um, we lived on Walbrook Road, uh, very near the duck pond. And it was very challenging uh, because, well, I was also an identical twin. That did not help. It was like, it was like literally like the freak show, right? You know, um, like Chang and Eng, the female Chang and Eng, Eng version, but we weren't, you know, conjoined, right? But we were like, you know, it was like kind of weird. But um, we, of course, we had friends. Of course, we, you know, loved the experience. But yeah, you know, it only takes one one person saying something um, or doing something to be impacted by that. And when, when you say to someone, when someone, something happens to someone and you say to that person, oh, don't listen to him, you know, you know, what, you know, it's like, it doesn't, you know, just dismiss it or whatever. That, that is not acknowledging the actual trauma that's actually happening. So as parents, we need to really be aware of, of that. Um, one thing that's really, I think, important to remember, I, I don't ever remember, remember this being an issue when I was at Edgemont, and I'm pretty sure it's not now, but I, when, when I was looking at statistics um, and trying to think about how I would present this, I, I came across information that uh, from the American Psychological Association, and um, it actually talked about, you know, I was reading about suicide, which thank God we, we don't really have too much of an issue with, but experiences of, of discrimination are actually a predictor of increased suicidal thoughts and attempts. All right, like that has not been on our radar right? Up to now, it's like, oh, students work hard. If, if something like that happens, it gets blamed on the family or blamed on a situation, right? But, you know, discrimination can actually affect the psyche of a student, right? And the students around him. Um, I had a situation in college where um, I was at a party and um, someone out of the blue, some random person that I had never met before had called me a chink. And it, it was really kind of bizarre and I wasn't prepared for it because, you know, we're all, have, we're all at a party. We're all having fun. We're all, 
and and it was like this booming voice that wanted kind of insisted on kind of single singling me at me out and making me feel like really terrible and you know there's a bizarre kind of shame that comes with you know being targeted right because you 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 feel there's a strange kind of shame and 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 um uncertainty and uh, uh, you know you question did i do something that triggered it and like all the things that you you know logically know are not true but emotionally right these are the kinds of things that happen so what i ended up doing and this is something that i want our young people to understand i went back to my dorm that night and i really wanted to lock myself in my room for the rest of the year but because i started writing about it i started writing in my journal about what happened just to sort out my thoughts i found myself getting very focused on what i was doing and by the next day i i had kind of a an op-edish kind of piece and i sent it to the the paper and what's interesting is that the paper published it and um you know it was just a school paper but it started a year long dialogue about race and you know how to confront it and how to handle it and you know by doing taking that that step it was it was almost as if i had transformed this really negative moment something that could have made me feel terrible for years and i transformed it into something really positive that's something i want to talk to your students about your your children about because you know we we need to accept that things will happen but since we know things will happen we will prepare you for the kinds of things that that can happen like what to do right so um one of the things that i learned from that technique and um and i've actually practiced it uh, over time using not just uh writing but um i'm actually a shoemaker so um so i've 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 realized that by focusing on certain thing, aspects about me and what i love love doing it kind of transforms this um whenever something negative happens and you know of course this is includes other things out besides race but um but when when i hear something on the news that i find really kind of destabilizing you know a woman gets acid in her face you know some something that makes me feel nervous about going out or whatever i come back to this like feeling that i have had when I do things, because then I get, if you get, if, if students get, or children get stuck in that feeling of helplessness um, or fear, that can be paralyzing. And instead of being paralyzed, um, what I what would like for them to know is how to come back into their own selves and be grounded in themselves and to feel the value of themselves, right? We always hear people talk about, oh, you should love who you are, right? But how, <laughs> like, has anyone bothered to tell people, to tell us how? Like, so this is one of the techniques that I wanna share with students, right? How to get back into yourself, how to feel your core beauty, your value, your purpose, right? Um, so these are just some of the things that that we uh that i will be talking about um i think for we we like i've said we've we've been operating on this idea that you know racism will eventually get better and i think um we need to acknowledge that it's probably not going anywhere anytime soon and it only will if we work together not just Asians, 
not just blacks, not just Latinos, but like all of us work together, right? And build coalitions. Um, we need to teach children that they can be prepared for when someone does something. They, there are things that they can do if they see something about happening, right? To someone else, um, you know, there are places that you can, you know, you can, I, I was talking earlier about um, a program that's a bystander in, um, intervention program, right? It doesn't mean that you have to put yourself at risk. All it means is you can learn techniques that can potentially distract, right? And um, help someone who might actually be in a dangerous situation. So these are the kinds of things that I, I plan on sharing. Um, I have a whole bunch of fact sheets and resources that um, I will share with you guys, I, um, with um, you know, your principal and, and um, Kyle, will, I'm sure email them out in his newsletter. So um, I think that's pretty much it for right now. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them and go from there. Great, thank you, Christina. And just as a reminder uh, to submit questions, we shared a Google form uh, at 6.30 this evening. And then over on Monday in the communication that went out, the PTSA also shared the Google form. So if you do have questions, we encourage you to submit those and we'll read those questions and have Christina answer them. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to um, also mention that, um, you know, I, I think, when people turn negative situations into positive ones, uh, that is so key. And I think teaching our young people how to do this is so important. Um, I'm a writer. I have decided to basically e express my ideas through my work, but this can happen in any arena. Um, empowerment can happen anywhere. So I think that's important for all parents to understand that, you know, it's not a situation that you have to accept. It's, it's just, you have to figure out how, you know, if there isn't a, a problem, then how to handle it. And I think that this is, this is going to be really wonderful for the, for the, your students. Thank you. Teresa, do we have any questions in yet using the Google form? We do not, not right now, we don't have any, so. Um, okay. So. Great, we'll give it another minute. And I think um, the thought was we wanted to make sure parents had a sense of conversations we're hoping to have with students. And our next step is to talk with Christina to find the appropriate time to meet with students of, around these important issues. And so we'll be talking and um, before those meetings happen with students, we'll definitely let parents in the community know. Great. Yeah, I think um, these kinds of issues around race are really difficult for young people to talk about unless we talk about them, unless we engage in that discussion. And you'd be shocked how much they have to say about it. So, you know, now's a really important time Great. Right. Um, it doesn't look, I have the Google form open as well. It doesn't look like we have any questions submitted at this time. So I think um, one option is if there's anything else, Christine, that you'd like to touch upon that you didn't mention, we could spend another couple minutes doing that. Or I think that's a great uh, overview so parents know what students will talk about with you and provide that opportunity to our student body. Yeah, um, I think, it, you know, one of the things we um, haven't mentioned is, is that we probably will break, break into groups, uh, smaller groups so that we can share experiences. Um, I have a, a friend who speaks about these kinds of things, uh, situations, he, he's black and um, he, he shared a story with um, some young people and it was amazing how many young people could relate to his story even though they weren't black. So, you know, this is not, an, you know, race is not an issue 
for any particular group. It's for all of us. And if we all address it, uh, we'll maybe get somewhere. Great. Teresa, I think we have two questions now. All right, let's see. So, Kyle, tell me how, here we go, responses. Um, uh, are questions anonymous? Yes, we'll make them anonymous. Um, I read your novel, Beauty, not knowing you were a former Edgemont student, and I absolutely loved it. I was wondering if you could share a bit about your personal experiences as an Asian American in the workplace and in the education system. What are some things you would like to see change? Thank you uh, for presentation. <laughs> well, thank you for that question. I, it took me many years to write that book. Uh, and I should, I should preface it by saying that uh, my first book, it was a collection of short stories called Troublemaker and Other Saints. Beauty was actually a short story from that collection. And after I finished that collection, I, I don't know if this happens to most people, but uh, this character would not stop speaking to me. So I ended up writing, novelizing this, this short story. And all of, almost all of the short stories that I have in my first collection deal with typing, stereotyping, typing, um, you know, you know, issues that we've all seen and heard of before that become kind of um, re repetitive, right? Like the mother daughter relationship after Amy Tan's, you know, books, you know, th there was a lot of that. So I explore the mother daughter uh, relationship, but in a very different way. Um, I will say that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of challenges as an Asian American woman in the, work, in the workplace. Uh, I was in publishing for many years. Uh, I'm, I've been writing for many years and I don't think it's just me. I, you know, any woman knows what mansplaining is. Um, you know, we've all, you know, been educated. We all, some of us have been highly educated in certain things. And yet uh, I find that the dismissing aspect happens, you know, pretty often. Um, not just to me, but to peers that I that I work with. And you know, when those situations happen, I think you know, it isn't that you need to just dismiss them or or you know let it just let it go, but you know, acknowledging them and then being able to kind of have a little humor uh, helps. So for me, when things happen uh, that I'm not pleased with, they often end up in my writing. And that's how I level things, level things out, right? Because um, my, my work really speaks for the things that, I, that are happening or I, or, or I feel need to be clarified or um, justified or, or, or spoken to and a lot of the issues in the in that book and my first book uh, pretty much intersect at the at race and gender and and some and some class issues so yes I mean I think I don't know if I answered this question um, well enough but I do find that my writing for me is not just a job it's a purpose. And, you know, oddly enough, that situation where, um, you know, someone called me a chink, um, where I was deeply mortified when it happened and just wanted to hide, it, it's what actually started me on this journey, right? And I think when we look back on these kinds of learning experiences, we realize, you know, 
that that wasn't so great but you know what it made me who i am it and and it made me it gave me this larger sense of purpose that is really quite fulfilling then then you see it from a very different angle right it's it's like you you feel like you are change making change and that is so powerful really really powerful and for me you know i feel anyway uh, i've been in publishing for so many years and writing for so many years that um that i have pretty much at this point uh become one of those people who's just in very different involved in many different aspects of publishing and um in the literary world so it's it's been really a wonderful ride and i think one of the reasons why this actually matters to me so much is that i want students to understand that this is a ride and that you know when you're young and something happens to you that's you know embarrassing or you know or terrible or you know it 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 becomes it's it, it it has a way of becoming like like you're in a fishbowl with it right and and you can't get out but if we can really share with students and and young people how you know what this might actually be help me some you know in my next step or i'll always look back and and have empathy or sympathy you know like it there there are good things to it um and that actually helps it helps psychologically right and we we never really think about those kinds of things um because uh, you know when i was growing up you know if you if you were asian and something happened it was like oh you know you know it it you know it won't happen when people are actually educated um that's really what we all thought but you know we see now that that's not really the case uh racism um can come from any sector but the opposite side of that is also true that you can confront any kind of racism um and you can learn how to be self you could self empower and learn how to empower the people around you and give them a voice thank you christina i have another question for you from the from the google form while representation of asian americans is high in ehs by the students and families by students and families what do you think we as parents can do to encourage more incorporation of their lived experiences in the classroom and the community? Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that I find very interesting is that, um, and I'm gonna use a, an analogy from my own life so that, uh, so, so that it, I'm clear about what I mean. I have a son who used to play hockey uh, ice hockey. He he played tier one hockey. We were up at Brewster like every day. And uh, it was kind of torture. I'm glad it's over. But um, what was interesting was there were three Asian kids on the team. And I didn't find out about this until many years later. But as it turned out, there was um, there was a time in the locker room where one of the kids was going on and on about um, like saying a lot of racist stuff about um, Ch Chinese, I think. And uh, when I asked my son if he had done anything, did he say anything back? He said, no. And I asked him why. And he said something really interesting that I really, I, I was really, it blew my mind. He said, one, it would have ruined the team. And then he also said that he would have had to get, had to fight this kid, which would have been ridiculous. And he just didn't want to go there, right? So even though there were three players on the team who were Asian, that still happened. So 
it, it made me realize like, look, you know, Edgemont might have a large population of, or a larger population of Asians than other schools, but that doesn't mean that these kinds of sentiments don't exist and that, um, that people don't uh, treat Asians or other groups um, in a in a in a manner that's equal or acknowledges them that in the same way, right? What I think is so huge is for any group, Asian or not, is one of the things that is a protective factor uh, when it comes to um, anything, uh, you know, regarding race or in terms of psych psychologically speaking, one of the most important things is to actually have identify with with your with a group, any group, right? Now, um, I think with Asians, um, there's been a tendency uh, in the past to kind of stay away um, from other Asians because if there weren't that many, that meant that if you actually socialize together you were like together. <laughs> and that was quite awkward when I was in high school, right? You know, if I talked to an Asian guy that were suddenly going out. So, so I, I remember those moments that were kind of weird and awkward and we would kind of, it kind of repelled us from each other. But what I've learned is, is that once I left Edgemont and I, you know, went to college, when I got back to New York City, I, became one of the people who founded an organization called the Asian American Writers Workshop. And the whole idea being that we would support and nurture Asian American writers, which there weren't that many at the time. It was like Amy Tan and Maxine Hong Kingston, all right? What I learned by, be, by having this core group of friends was that it gave me a sense of solidity, right? Like. I felt like I could just be Asian and it was okay. And it was the first time I had ever realized that there was such a huge difference, like living in a white um, world, right? You just, you adapt, you become, right? You become like whatever, you, you're just you, right? But when you identify with any group, um, the you start to understand like, oh, you have commonalities, You you can actually understand each other um, in different ways. So that's one way I would say. And, and by the way, um, it doesn't have, have to actually be racial, right? It could be like, if your kid plays soccer and loves soccer, your kid I, you know, identifies with other kids who also love soccer and to basically nurture the, the groups that mean, have a lot of meaning for your child, right? Um, but also when it comes to, you know, identifying with your background or race, racial group, um, it doesn't actually have to be in any particular group. There are many different kinds of groups, right? Like, um, you know, for me, it was, I'm a writer. So I, I started with a group of Asian American writers, uh, and, you know, it can be anything. And. I think that that is one of the um, ways that that students and young people can really feel solid about themselves. Like they can really just feel connected. And this is true with any young person, you know, students who feel connected, um, they, they, they thrive, they do, they do better, right? Because they're actually engaging and they feel seen and that is so important. I mean, way beyond academic, um, you know, importance. You know, we we know that the kids will get a good education there at Edgemont, right? But to balance that, they need to actually have. We have to have some awareness about where they are, you know, socially and psychologically, right? Um, I don't know about everyone here, but my son is Chinese. And um, he played tier one hockey, but, you know, for a while we lived, um, you know, in the suburbs and 
th there was this bizarre expectation that he was like a geek and he actually played hockey. So it was very odd kind of um, like interaction. And he had to prove to everyone that he was actually athletic. And I, I don't think that he has that pressure now. He's, you know, in the city, um, he's in a school that's like, I don't know, it's a very high percentage of Asians as well. And, um, and he doesn't feel the need to have to prove that. He actually started to uh, come into himself more and feel more comfortable with himself. And, um, and I think that that matters like who you're around matters. Like if you feel connected, it matters. If you feel like you are, you know, not just doing something, you know, for college, right? But doing something that actually makes you feel like you have a purpose or you're doing something that, that is larger than yourself. That is so important. And especially when you feel like I'm different, right? Um, this feeling of difference can, you know, to overcome that, think about it, uh, you know, even in literature and life, you know, the things that connect everyone, you know, are friendship, love, we all, we all understand um, loss, we all understand the same things, right? But what, but what makes a community actually function well, in a, in a, in a way that's kind of um, connected is when we are all not just physically present, we are actually mentally present, right? And we're there for each other. And, and here's my son. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, I think, yeah, you know, you have to go outside for a minute. I'll be out there so shortly. Sorry. Um, so yes. Yeah, so I don't. I think that I um, address that question. Yes. Yes. We have uh, a couple more questions. Okay. One is a bit of an organizational question, maybe for Kyle or or you, Christina. Uh, it says, "Will we be able to learn what our students bring up in your discussion?" Um, I think Kyle can speak to that more, but. Um, I think there are some things that we can share with parents, but there, um, to in order to have that kind of rapport with the students, they have to know and feel, um, you know, trust. And some of the things that they may say um, are not things that they want to share with everyone, right? So we 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 may talk about things generally. Uh, we, we may speak about um, some issues that came up, but we would never want to make, expose someone or make, make anyone feel like they got, you know, tricked into saying something that they didn't want to say or, you, you know what I'm saying? Um, so Kyle, would you like to? Um, yeah. Christina, just to build on that, I think uh, we would share general themes that emerge from the conversation. And I think for us as a school to hear students' experience, it helps us inform our work and what we need to do moving forward. So I think it's a great opportunity to have the conversation with students. It's a great opportunity for us to look at ourselves and what we're doing as a school, and then to share some of those themes with the community so everyone has the same information. Okay. We, uh, we have another question here. Um, what is your approach for diffusing any negative commentary and or encouraging compassionate conversation? Um, so there, there are different aspects to this question, right? Because there are different levels of, um, you know, verbal or nonverbal violence, right? So uh, not every question can be um, answered in the same respect. However, I will say that there are strategies that can be learned. You know, uh, when someone, so I, I'll share with you one strategy that I have. When someone says something to me that I find is really dismissive or, or hurtful, I, I, I try to connect with them. And, you know, it's not always possible, of course, but I try to, um, 
really feel them, like how connect. And, and, and I say, you know, if that's how you feel, there's nothing, I'm, you know, nothing I can do, but, you know, I don't see why you have to be that way, you know, or, you know, that, that, that connecting, I, I don't know if anyone saw this, but on social media, um, I think this was around the time of the, the Muslim ban, right? And, and um, there was a woman who was confronted by um, someone who was, you know, a white nationalist. And she, what she did was she looked right at him, not in a hateful way, not, you know, in an anxious way. She just looked at him. She just looked right at him and it diffused his anger. He was so startled by it, right? But, you know, not, there isn't one answer for every single person. So these, there are just strategies, right? That we would, that we would talk about, that we would share. And, um, and just so that, you know, ki- you know, this, kids have, you know, different tools in their, in their back pocket that they can take out. And instead of being like, oh, duh, I wish I had said later on, right? Or why, why didn't I, it's because they're not prepared, right? But if you prepare them, they're not necessarily that surprised by it. Like they might be surprised that it happens when it happens because you never know when a thing happens, but they know that it can happen and that these are some of the options that they can take. Thank you for that. So interesting. Um, Our final question so far is, um, which is, which is sort of in that same vein, do you ever feel like you have to be an ambassador for your race? And if so, how do you deal with that? Yeah, actually, this is a funny question. Um, So, you know, we were at the time, one of the first Chinese um, uh, and the first Chinese American English speaking family on the block uh, when we first moved in. And there was a lot of pressure to, to be like everyone else. Like, you know, my mom used to like, you know, she would boil herbs. I don't know if any of you know what, like, like she believed in Chinese medicine and these herbs, um, if any of you have ever dealt with this, they're awful, right? And I would just be mortified. I, it was like, mom, everyone on the block is going to know, like, what are you doing? It was t- like horrible. And, and, and I would always say, now they're going to think all Chinese are like that. And, you know, they're going to think, you know, I'm like that. And um, there was a lot of um, pressure. And um, I think for me, where I am now, there's less and less of it. Uh, in part, I think, because I think I've, really come to a place where I feel more comfortable with myself. And so if someone sees me and, and, you know, has, you know, a judgment, I don't, it doesn't in my mind get reflected onto other people because I, it's almost like my personality is bigger than that. So I feel like it's a reflection of my personality. Um, and so I don't have that so much now. Um, if my mom started cooking herbs, uh, who knows, maybe I'd be a little bit nervous about that, but, um, yeah. Very interesting. Well, thank you. Those are our questions from, uh, from the community to date to for, for now. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and I'm um, anxious to hear what uh, will, will arise from the conversations with the students. That would, I think will be very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah. I think it'll be great to connect with them and, and kind of show them how to, um, how to navigate right, certain situations and um, understand what's happening with them you know, because I'll bet you anything, they have a lot to say about some of the shootings that have occurred. And, um, you know, you know, this whole, um, everything happening with the uh, Floyd, um, 
uh, trial. trial right now. And, um, you know, it's, it's just there. It's, it's, it's hard to, um, to manage everything, right? And we don't end up talking about some, some things, but you, you'd be shocked how much kids have to say about it and what they're thinking. They actually have a lot going on. Um, they're thinking about these kinds of issues a lot. There, there seem to be more and more issues. Um, and they know that these kinds of issues are going to be part of their life, right? They're not going to wake up and it's going to be gone. That's for certain. Mm -hmm. so. Right. So the better, the better we can educate them with talks like this, the, the better that they'll, the sure they can be in their footing when they go out into the world. I really hope so. I really hope, um, you know, going into the world and thriving really has so much to do with how, how you feel about yourself, right? You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't actually feel solid and if you don't actually feel that, that inner value, that inner worth, right? You know, you can end up not reaching your potential. And, you know, it can be a racial incident. It could be anything, some, you know, anything. But if they know how to kind of sort themselves and ground themselves and get back to that place where they, they know how valuable and important they are, then, then we're getting somewhere. Then we're creating a society where kids really can thrive. They really have tools to, to feel strong and to feel grounded no matter what. Christine, I just want to take a second to recognize our superintendent of schools, Dr. Victoria Newell. Hi, how are you? Hi, Christina. So sorry to be late. I look forward to listening to the whole presentation on our YouTube channel. So sorry uh, to be late and so happy you're here and such an important message in a timely, timely uh, way to help it's us. It's wonderful meeting you. I, um, when I did I had a reading for my first book uh, at the Barnes and Noble on Central Avenue and uh, Nancy Tadakin came and that was really fun. That's so great. I, I actually had forwarded this event to Nancy Tadakin for this evening and she wasn't able to attend, but she looks forward to watching on YouTube as well. Wonderful. Say hi. I will for sure. So Edgemont is just, I feel like it's so ahead of the game. It really is. It's just, I'm really proud that I am an Edgemonter and it's just a great place. We are too, we are too. <laughs> Christine, I wanna thank you again for taking the time tonight and we look forward to the next steps with our students. Uh, we will share that communication uh, with the community just to keep everyone updated. And I wanna thank the PTSA again for making tonight happen. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you to the PTA, thank you. Okay. Have a great night. Everybody.